Welcome to 132 Problems Revisiting Mormon Polygamy, where we are starting on this new course of studying the scriptural, theological, and historical case for Joseph's polygamy. I'm so glad that you are here. I always recommend listening to these episodes in order, starting at the beginning, because I do think that the scriptural and theological case for polygamy is the most important part of this discussion. But this part is important as well, so I am very excited to be able to bring you this interview, this discussion with this fascinating man, John Hayacek. I'm so glad that he reached out to me and that I had the opportunity to talk to him. I think he brings such just a fascinating and really important perspective to this discussion. So I um, am so eager to continue to learn these new insights and perspectives. I really value the information that he has about the historical documents and about William Clayton and the journals and all of these different parts. So I hope that this will be as valuable and insightful to you as it was to me. I'm really glad that you're here. Please enjoy. All right, welcome to this episode of 132 Problems. I am actually really excited to bring to you this information today. I am here with my new friend, John Hayacek, who um, I met online. He's been, he's been coming around more and more. And then recently we spoke together at an event and I was fascinated by what he shared. Um, and so, so I'm really excited to have this opportunity to sit down and talk to him and get his expertise and information and share it with all of you. So. My best attempt at an, at an introduction, and John, you're going to have to help me out a bit with this, but John has an amazing story that's going to be a little bit foreign to those of us who are Utah Mormons and kind of, we, since we're the biggest ones, we tend to think we're the only ones. I think that <laughs> we don't realize the other branches of Mormonism that have a lot to bring to this discussion. So my understanding, John, is that your family moved into a tiny little town on a road called Mormon Road that basically was an early establishment in the Mormon church and the orig the descendants of the original Mormons. And when you say they didn't come west, you mean they didn't even go west to Missouri or Nauvoo, let alone to Salt Lake, right? Well, Am some I did. No, there was a gathering place for, it was like an outpost to Nauvoo. So Boree, Wisconsin, in the town of Burlington, Wisconsin, is a is a ghost town now, but it's a, it was a village on the uh, County Line Road. They named it Mormon Road. And it was established there by Joseph Smith Sr., if you can believe it, in 1835 during the Kirtland period, when he basically set up a branch in, in Burlington, which was then called Foxville in 1835. So they were okay. Mormons there in 1835. There were Mormons there in 1844. And there were still Mormons there in 1856 that didn't go to Utah. And there were still their grandchildren and great grandchildren when my family moved there in 1980. Okay, this is, isn't this amazing? So they were not Brigham's church. They were not LDS. They were not RLDS in um, the reorganized church. They were their own independent um, branch, I guess, of or sect of Mormonism, and was their focus primarily on the um, Book of Mormon and the early, do they have a version of the Doctrine and Covenants? Do they have the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants that they rely on? Well, they're like the Nauvoo Church, but they're still arguing about the succession crisis. And the leanings, of course, at that time were towards James Strang and still are. So of the different succession claimants in 18... 44 through, oh, say about 1867. There are about six large groups that are still, you know, viable groups. The uh, followers of James Strang uh, from 1844, Brigham Young was elected to be the president of the church in 1847. And I have the document. I have Brigham Young's uh, election with me from Pottawatomie okay. County, uh, Iowa in 1847. And then, and then, you know, the, uh, um, the reorganized church in 1860, the Temple Lot Church in 1867, the, the Monongahela, Pennsylvania group with William Bickerton, which are sort of a, a re-enlivenment of Sidney Rigdon's group in, in 1863. Uh, who did I miss? Oh, Alpheus Cutler 
uh, is on the Mormon trail and doesn't continue all the way west. And um, in about 1853, uh, he makes a succession claim. So those are the six viable uh, traditions of, of Mormon uh, succession claimants, let's say. That are still, are those all still in existence? Viable today, yes. Yeah, six. Wow, six okay. Succession crisis period until today. And then, of course, all the different uh, representations of those so there are obviously many, many um, churches that believe that Joseph Smith III was 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 Joseph Smith's successor, um, but they're that one tradition of the reorganized church in 1860. Okay, so you are a Strangite. If I'm a Brighamite, you're a Strangite. Is that? And, and but you aren't among the Strangites well, that joined the RLDS. You're right. from that tradition. And, right. So they formed the nucleus of the reorganized church. Uh, in 1860, really already the reorganized church existed uh, informally as a what they called the new organization in, well, 1853, 1854, they start to, uh, they start to build momentum before persuading Joseph Smith uh, to take on the mantle, let's say, of his father. Okay, okay, so I want to back up to your history. So your father moved you to this town where there were these descendants, and you were a kid who joined in with these elderly descendants of of these early Mormons, and you became right. sort of the young guy in their congregation, if I'm understanding this correctly, and the one to That's carry it exactly on. exactly kind of what happened. So I, this all started really in 1973, it took seven years for my father to make the decision to move from Minneapolis, where I was raised, and move us to uh, Wisconsin. But we, but we, um, but we studied for seven years. So I, I really have fifty years from 1973 to 2023. I have fifty years from age nine until uh, now uh, studying what I call contested Latter Day Saint history, or um, yeah, yeah, contested. So, okay, Reflected. I want to get into that too. I first want to ask, so was your father converted? Like, why did he move you to this little ghost town on Mormon Road? Was For that reason, yes, decision? he was converted. Okay. Yes, he was converted. Okay. He was, a uh, mm -hmm, absolutely, yes. So my story starts okay. really with my family story. My dad was a <clears throat> agnostic a physicist, worked on his PhD at the University of Minnesota, almost side by side with President Nelson, um, and, uh, you know, worked on some top secret missile defense projects. He was chief engineer for the Nike missile defense program. And then he was chief okay. engineer for the software on the CAT scan. And then he just gives all this up and he moves to, he moves to this ghost town uh, to be close to the roots of, of Mormonism, Mormon history. That is amazing. So, so you are one of those stories that, you know, we talk about how you can kind of see the finger of God on people. It feels like that's kind of your story as well. I'm sure that's how it has felt to you. And so going forward, you got very interested in Mormon history from a very young age. And I assume that by contested Mormon history, to some extent, you mean, you know, you're the little guy, you have this big other church. So you're, you're, you're having to prove your case much more than we ever felt like we had to prove our case because, you know, we, we didn't, we didn't know that we had to argue against you, I guess. So sure. that's, yeah, that yeah. toughened you up in, in getting yes, information. Yes, yes. And so now what I find fascinating is that you called BS on Mark Hoffman before pretty much anyone else. So I want you to tell me why you knew, uh, and you were just a teenager, correct? And Right. So in 1981, I was taking a current affairs class, part of the history program at my high school. I would have been 17 and just about to graduate, but we got free subscriptions to Time and Newsweek, which were reporting on the news of Hoffman's discoveries in May of 1981. And I was already immersed in the writings of Joseph Smith, so familiar enough to look at those and think that's not, you know, you can feel it. I could, uh, others okay. couldn't, but I, but I wasn't reading Let's... probably as broadly. I was so, I was so immersed in just Joseph Smith and and the Nauvoo period that I think, you know, it. There were problems with uh, the the documents and the relationship to, for example, um, 
uh, the, the Joseph Smith's new translation or the Joseph Smith translation or the inspired version, depending on what uh, branch you're coming So when you say you were studying Joseph Smith, I, I mean, I assume that doesn't just mean like our LDS version of the Book of Mormon. Like, tell me what you mean when you were studying the writings and the words of Joseph Smith. What access did you have? Well, you said like the hand of God. I mean, these people are serious people. We We were going to church with an outhouse and a oil burning stove and everybody... In those days, it sounds like so long ago, 1980, we still brought all, all of our Nauvoo books. So you carry your, your quad to church, but they carried their Times and Seasons and their Evening and Morning Star and their Vori Herald and their Northern Islander and their, you know, Messenger and Advocate from Kirtland. And, and they... Have they published these or did they just have the originals how, or, or copies of both, copies? How? Both. Okay. Yes. So that's a it's a real history based church because they're still uh, validating their faith through uh, through presidential succession through prophetic succession. Okay, so just like I can say Alma chapter twelve, you can say times of seas- times and seasons this date. And, like you're oh, yes. very familiar, you can quote. Sure. Yes, yes. That is okay. That's so cool. That, thank you for helping so, me understand that. So with so that sermon with might that be- background. Yeah, a sermon might be about the word of wisdom, but they're gonna but they're gonna quote Hiram Smith from the Times and Seasons in 1842 and say, but Hiram said, you know, they're serious. Yes. Okay. And do they have sort of um when I say articles of faith, I don't mean Joseph's. I mean, do they have their sectarian, these are the things we believe, or are they just in there hammering it out and fig and hashing, you they're know, figure like, it out like like historians uh do everywhere. Yes. They're they're all historians. They're they're well represented at the John Whitmer Historical Association, for example. They're they're very active in their in their heritage and their okay. history and their culture. So your congregation is still there. Are you still an active member of this congregation? Well, I live in Independence, Missouri now. So I'm living in my second uh, church history site. Um, the church uh, that follows James Strang is, you know, nearly extinct and it's very fragmented, but it but it's still like vibrant and it has a lot of uh, enthusiasm among historians and other, even non-Mormons, uh, uh, people and scholars in Wisconsin and Michigan. So I always say James Strang has more fans than, than followers. Um, the church up there is, is a little fragmented. There's a church that was almost like a reorganized Strangite church. They actually denominate themselves Strangites, even though I consider that pejorative. Uh, as you would Brighamite, but they, but they, but they formed a new church in 1961. Uh, their charter actually says, you know, they're not affiliated with any previously existing church. So they formed a new uh, Strang church, and they're. Uh, I was brought into a, to a inner circle of of these children and grandchildren of the Nauvoo settlers. I mean, the person who baptized me and ordained me was the grandchild. Not the great grandchild, but the grandchild of of somebody that was in Palmyra when Joseph Smith had his first vision. That was in Nauvoo, working on the Nauvoo Temple. That then was in Wisconsin and in Michigan uh, during the eighteen forties. Oh my gosh! You can almost touch it. That's kind of yeah. Uh, that's so cool. So so they shared with me their books, and they they emphasized you know the importance of of examining not just the succession crisis, but any part of Latter Day Saint history through through historical documents, but with a skepticism that you don't see among scholars in Utah. Okay. Okay. So you, it sounds like we're kind of selected or chosen. You were their hope to carry this Yes. This yes. On. I was probably and, the hope of a nearly extinct church, right? Okay. I, I just, it gives me chills. I just, I don't know. I see God's hand working in so many ways. And it's so, you know, I, I love hearing this. And so, so what made you leave that church? You moved to Missouri. And then and then how do you affiliate now? Do you have you started a new branch of those kinds of people or are you just independent? No, most okay most followers of James Strang are independent, um, not part of the 1961 uh, mainline followers, but more scattered and independent and meeting in their homes, as I always have with my family and friends. Okay, so you you have a gathering of family and friends that you still do you do the sacraments? Do you? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, 
and and do you do that weekly? Is that, are these okay questions to ask? I'm so interested. So if I ask anything in a we do it on Saturday, actually. Yes, the Latter Day Saints in Wisconsin are Seventh Day Sabbath keepers. Uh, James Strang uh, said that uh, he was he was following the the Joseph Smith, you know, re was reconciling the Old and New Testaments and restoring, as he even said in a sermon in 1844, he was restoring everything from every prior dispensation. He was restoring the ordinances and the laws and the priesthoods and and everything. And and so he was restoring everything that existed prior to the law of Moses, but maybe at the time of Moses. So we viewed or he viewed uh, things like sacrifice. And by the way, Joseph Smith did too, talked about animal sacrifice on, on many occasions, uh, animal sacrifice and restoring things like that. So ultimately, you know, you're restoring the Old Testament things like an Aaronic priesthood and a Melchizedek priesthood and temples and tabernacles, maybe polygamy, depending on your view. Um, but but this belief that, the, <laughs> I know, I know, but the full gospel, but the full, but it, but you know, it was being talked about in Nauvoo at least. So yeah, this was because... something that was, so the Smiths are coming out of a rich uh, tradition of restoration in Vermont, uh, where the Smiths lived for 25 years and then in Western New York for 15 years. So they moved to Vermont in 18, in 1791. They're there for 25 years and it began in around 1800. There's a lot of uh, what other scholars outside of our movement call restoration. And that spreads from Vermont to Kentucky. You see it in how, how people name their children, their, their Old Testament people that are, you know, if you're in a log cabin in Vermont or Kentucky, you're reading the Old Testament, you've got nothing else to do. The Smiths didn't even have a door on their cabin when they, when they first settled in Vermont in, in 1791. I mean, they spent the winter with a fire in the doorway um, so, you know, times oh are tough word. and you see how the Smiths, Lucy names her children Old Testament names while they're in Vermont. And when, once they get out of Vermont, she's naming her children aristocratic names like like Catherine and Don Carlos. But in but in Vermont, she's naming her children Ephraim and and Joseph and Samuel and and uh, well, Alvin, I don't know where that comes from, but but uh Hiram even is an Old Testament name or a Masonic name, but. Um, oh, interesting. Okay. So, but so you're, okay. so you're, so you're there. So you're, in, you're in this, you're in this restoration uh, movement. And so Joseph then is, is still, you know, it, 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 it's that faith of that Smith family that, that, that has the Book of Mormon brought to them and, and, and then, and then goes through this restoration process that I think the and they were oh they were in some ways similar to you where you're the elderly people that that adopted you in you know um saw you with sort of a prophetic mission maybe I would maybe that's the wrong word but with a mission that they and and the Joseph Smith family his family saw him with a prophetic mission to carry forward they had the um right the family tradition that there would be a prophet in their line and so he he was they didn't just view him as a kid. They viewed him with a, with a mission to accomplish, is my understanding. And so yeah, but I'm the farthest thing from a prophet. <laughs> I've never. No, I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I know I said the wrong thing. I just I just think it's interesting to kind of carry that weight. Yeah, you I'm know, a pretty lowly. <laughs> yeah. So Joseph is clearly prepared for this mission, and he's prepared for this mission in the context and environment of the 25 years his parents spent in Vermont and the 15 years they spent in Western New York from. 1816 until 1831. So he's prepared, but he's not prepared in in nothing. He's prepared in a the 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 America is prepared for the church. There okay. is there is restorate there is restoration yeah. enthusiasm taking place. And so Joseph Smith is able to, with the Book of Mormon, persuade people like Sidney Rigdon. You know, and what does the Book of Mormon have? The Book of Mormon has this this uh, reconciliation of Old Testament and New Testament. And Joseph Smith is still talking about that consistently all the way through 1844. And in 1844, when he's giving his sermons in the spring, he's talking about the restoration of all prior dispensations. And so, so throughout his life, that was his vision. That was what he... So, right. So we, under James Strang, we see these this continuation of restoring offices and 
um, priesthoods and, and ordinances. And so you see the Seventh day Sabbath restored under James Strang in the, in the late 1840s. Okay. Okay. So let me ask you a question. So what, how would you describe your testimony of Joseph Smith, your testimony of the Book of Mormon? Do you view him as a divinely called prophet of God who restored all of this and translated golden plates? Um, absolutely. Sure. Yes. Say that again. You said yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes, of course. Okay. Yes. But my role in, in meeting you and, and in the community you and I share is as that of a historian. So I'm an ordinary um, Latter-day Saint and I, uh, you know, fervent historian. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I know we're blending topics just because I find it fascinating. So I appreciate, I know I, 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 you're, you're here to talk to me because of your historical work and your historical expertise, but I didn't want to leave this aside because I think it's good for all of us to understand, you know, I, I think it's a fascinating story and I appreciate understanding a little bit more of who you are and where you come from and what your perspective is. And so, so I have another question. Now, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that String became a polygamist, which is what led to the RLDS church, Jason Briggs. And if I, you know, I'm, I'm still getting that figured out a bit, sure. but mm -hmm. so, so does how, like, like if you are in that, and I'm, I apologize for using a pre pejorative string. I, I don't, I just, I'm trying to use it. No, it's okay. So, um, so do you like, like, where's polygamy for you? Do you reject that in string and they both followed the same, like, like, how do you look at that? Well, so as a historian, you know, I'm a cultural historian. I'm a social historian. I'm not, I don't answer the question of morality and it doesn't, it's not a concern to me. I just park that, I guess. So I'm interested in what happened and you know, James Strang was a was a really good human. He was an abolitionist even before he was Mormon. He uh, ordained blacks by General Conference Resolution in 1849. He ordained women uh, to some offices by 1851. Uh, his his followers ordained Indians in the 19th century. Uh, he was a Michigan state legislator, elected twice, and uh, all of his speeches are about. Uh, favorable and fair treatment of blacks and Indians, especially. I want to Indian point out that Michigan. what I'm hearing, he sounds a lot like Joseph Smith, actually. Right. Because and his polygamy, James Strang had four uh, wives after his first. Um, and he, his, his take on polygamy was a lot different. It was, I think, you know, social experimentation. It was, uh, Old Testament based, it was faith based, but it was also very, um, it was very kind to women. It was actually the argument was that women should have a right to marry whomever they want. It was almost like a libertarian uh, argument that women should have a right to marry whomever they want without, um, they should have, they should have choice to marry whoever, whomever they want. Okay, I I definitely have my thoughts on that, but I am. Oh, I know, curious, I know, did... but here's the thing. But here's the thing. Because I'm not against polygamy, it actually means more that I'm skeptical of the history of Joseph Smith and polygamy. Okay, I that know was my that question. this was being kicked around in Nauvoo, and I sometimes I've kind of coined the expression I've now heard elsewhere, but I coined the expression that Joseph Smith flirted with polygamy, the family flirted with polygamy, they were in the environment of polygamy going all the way back to probably 1800, 1802. Um, they uh, polygamy has come up in the Kirtland Doctrine and Covenants. It's come up, uh, you know, in the in the Book of Mormon. I mean, polygamy is not something that Joseph Smith has never heard of. So they're going to be talking about right. this in Nauvoo, and and that's okay with me. Yeah. But, so I. But there are but this these fifth these these historians that have fifty wedding conspiracies. They're conspiracy theorists. If you believe that Joseph Smith had fifty wives and therefore had fifty fifty weddings, and there are no documents, there are no children. You know, you're a conspiracy theorist. All the other historians that uh, are part of that mainstream new Mormon history that have that have tried to compromise faith-based Mormonism with anti-Mormonism, the protagonists and antagonists, you know, they're, they're, um, 
They're conspiracy theorists. Okay, I'm going to want to get to that because because that's fascinating to hear. So I want to ask James String, do you see any tie between Joseph Smith and James String? Was his polygamy because he learned it from Joseph Smith? Um, he probably learned it from Joseph Smith's followers. He had so okay. many people from Nauvoo. He had, you know, William Marks, who was who was uh, the stake president in Nauvoo, is James Strang's counselor. George Adams is another counselor. George Adams was in 1844 ordained to be an especial apostle to to Russia. There are just so many people. You know, Joseph James Strang. Whatever you think about James Strang, I want to I want to tell you that I'm in good company. So James Strang was supported by, and let's talk about his letter. James Strang alleges he gets a letter from Emma. From, James Strang alleges he gets a letter from Joseph Smith, but Emma Smith believes it's real. His wife, who knows his, like I know if you showed me a letter from my mom or somebody close to me, yeah. I would know if they wrote it. He has Emma Smith that believes this is a letter from her husband. Lucy believes it's a letter from her son. All of Joseph Smith's sisters believe Joseph Smith wrote the letter. His only surviving brother, William, Joseph and Hiram's brother, believes. His own bishop, his own stake president, his mayor, his postmaster, his city marshal, all the important, so many important people, and the artistic people, the free thinkers like Sutliff Maudsley and David Rogers, the people that wrote books and, and edited newspapers and uh, I can go on and on. Several of the apostles, several of the presidents of 70 follow James Strang. The letter was highly credible. All The Book of Mormon witnesses and Joseph Smith's clerks, all the Book of Mormon witnesses. Maybe we don't know about Oliver Cowdery for sure, but Oliver Cowdery moves to James Strang's settlement. He's in Walworth County. He practices law in the same courthouse with James Strang at the same time that all the other witnesses are supporting James Strang. This so, is an incredible thing that's that's vanished from history. And I'm not here to argue the faith part of it. But as a matter of history, it, James Strang is highly likable. Well, that's why so many historians are, you know, historians are enthusiastic about James Strang, even if. Yes, well, and just so you know, I'm not even slightly challenging you. I'm fascinated. I love learning about this. I want to know. So, so what you're talking about, just so everyone is up with us, the letter is the is the letter that Joseph Smith wrote declaring James String to be his successor. And is that letter still in existence? Do you own that? No, Yale University owns that one. Yeah. Okay, but we can access it and look at it online. You can, yes. Okay, I'll see if I can track down a picture of that because that is that is really cool. So that's the letter you're talking about that Joseph. So so there is no reason to not believe that Joseph wrote a letter to James String declaring him to be. Do you know the wording? Is it to, to be the new president of the church? To, like, what's the wording on? Well, it? so that's an implied appointment, and that's one of the complications of that letter. That letter uh, implies based on context in the letter that James Strang has been appointed, but some historians actually believe the letter is authentic, but don't agree with the conclusions of the letter. Uh, at, in 1844, in May of, eight, uh, uh, February of 1844, uh, Joseph is sending expeditions all around the country. He's sending James Emmett and others, 25 people probably to uh, Oregon. He's sending Lyman White to Texas. He's Harley P. Pratt went right up by James Strang's community in Chicago, which is today just an hour, an hour and a half. Harley Pratt was looking at Chicago as a as an alternative to Nauvoo because it was friendlier and, and they wanted to get onto Lake Michigan, which is where James Strang ended up settling. So okay. So this this idea that, that the context is correct in this letter. So it's not just that that the people close to Joseph Smith thought it was authentic, but there's a lot of there's a lot of the voice of Joseph Smith is in the letter. It wasn't in the Hoffman documents. It is in that letter. Um, um, the context is correct for the events happening in Nauvoo, even though James Strang is in Wisconsin, where if he had forged the letter, he couldn't have known uh, so much. That's sure. in it's a highly credible letter, but you may not conclude, you may conclude the letter is authentic, but disagree that. So people think James Strang was supposed to establish a stake. Yeah, he was going to he was going to be a stake president not not Joseph Smith's successor well in any case I'm very thankful that James string kept his 
um, his branch going because I think that the richness that you and and your fellow um, congregants or branch members are able to bring with the historical work you've done and the other perspective, I think it's so important and makes the whole discussion so much richer because I think you have a very unique voice and perspective and sort of um, mastery over, like you said, the voice of doc of Joseph Smith and the documents and the, you know, that I think is really essential in this discussion. So I appreciate you walking us through that because I think it's very enlightening to all of us and important to understand. And just in a real like one minute summary then, so Jane, it doesn't end there. That's the beginning of the James Strang era. So there's 12 years of dramatic history. There's you know, restorative, other restorative things taking place. James Trang translates books and, and records and he has witnesses and then he's ultimately killed just like Joseph Smith in almost identical circumstances, shot by two people that, uh, that were disgruntled followers uh, and they conspired with the US government. The US Navy sent a Navy ship in and they assassinated James Strang. So it's, it's quite a story, but um, and then they get, and then they're printing a book. So the book of commandments, you know, about is just the press is destroyed in independence in 1833, July 20th, 1833. Um, exactly 12 years, well, 12 years after Joseph Smith is killed, James Strang's killed, but he's printing a book called the book of the law of the Lord, almost parallel to the book of commandments. And just as the book of commandments was destroyed with one signature that still had to be printed, the book of the law still had one signature to be printed and they destroyed the press and the, the she uncut sheets were gathered up and, and taken off the, uh, the county and taken to Jackson County, which not the same Jackson County, Jackson County, Wisconsin, but there's like a hundred cool parallels with James Strang. That and is, the, and okay, the saints we're were then driven to... out of the county. So we're going to have to dig into that more and more because now I have a million more questions and that is fascinating. So maybe I'll have to have you on again to talk to, to, to talk more about this. Okay, so just then, so to so segue out of that then. So the point is not about James Strang. It's I don't want to make right. the faith-based thing right now. My point is that that's what drives my quest for documents. So I was shut out uh, from the church history department. I was writing them letters in 1982 when I was a teenager they answered me. The first presidency even answered me. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to write to them, but they always answered. And um, then I, I started going to the church history department in 1989, and I was just completely shut out. I wanted to see Willard Richards' diary. I wanted to see William Clayton's diary. I, I didn't get to see a lot of things. They did let me type. I, I made the first known typescript of the teacher's quorum record book from Kirtland, but not Willard Richards' diary like I wanted to see. So I started collecting documents. I started just buying my own. I bought a Joseph Smith. Okay, so let let me sum this up because I want to make sure I'm on. I'm, so what you are saying is you had this fascination with church history as a kid. You were well enough versed in all of the Nauvoo, Kirtland and Nauvoo era documents to recognize. And 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 when I say that you um, that you opposed. Um, Mark Hoffman, you actually officially did. You published an article opposing him. So you've got that on record. And I've got so it on record. No, wait, I have, the, I have the carbon copy. I didn't have any credentials. And I, some people okay. would still argue I don't have any credentials, but I sent letters to the editor as a, as a 17 year old. I sent letters to the editor of Time and Newsweek. They weren't published by, but I made them on carbon copy on a old Remington typewriter. So I. OK, that's good. I'm, OK, I like that you clarified that. But you do have like the proof because because we can all say, oh, I knew Mark wasn't legit now. But you actually have the evidence that you knew it originally. So I think I, that that speaks highly to your credibility. So with all of this experience, this um, I would say not even just an interest, a passion, you know, your fascination with church history. You wanted to see what was available in Salt Lake, right? With with right. the LDS mm -hmm. church and they wouldn't allow you access because you right. were not a member of the Salt Lake based church. Am I getting that correct? Well, that it felt that way, but I think a lot of people were denied access, but no, certainly there's an elite class of, of prestigiously educated and church or church educated, you know, church employed and church published historians that do get to see the William Clayton diaries. The people that have seen them, you know, just not me. Um, okay. I'm shut out. Yes. 
Okay, and so they wouldn't grant access. So it's very, I guess, I guess, to not overstate it, it's very protected. The church history archives are are extremely protected. We don't know who has access to them, but certainly you weren't giving ac- given access. And so you had no choice but to start c- making your own collection, to start trying to get the documents yourself so that they couldn't just be sent to the archive so that you could do your own research. Am I on getting it so far? Exactly, right, yes. Okay, so you became, that's when you became a competitor. Like you were going to auctions bidding against the the group that the church had sent to get those. So the church is still collecting documents and adding them to the archive. The church is yes. doing that actively now without, and they're not like advertising all of the documents that they acquire. They're just sending they them actually, to Actually, the no, they have a pretty, they have a pretty low budget. I don't, they don't buy a lot. They, they generally don't buy from individuals. Uh, but if a high profile document shows up on the national market, they will they will compete for that and usually lose. But um, they okay. they they have a small a small document budget, I think. Or some people say they don't have it. I think maybe sometimes somebody will step in. It's is maybe part of it. If there's a national uh, high profile auction, the church may uh, may find a philanthropist to help them a bid or or to pay for them. That's so interesting because we're not uh, like church lacking in wealth. So it's interesting that they that they are having philanthropists help instead of I, I, anyway, I find that fascinating that they're maybe it's just they don't feel that's a good use of the Lord's money. You know, I, I find that's that how we got the Book of Abraham manuscripts. Joseph Smith had philanthropists, you could say church members paid for the for the papyri uh, in in the 1830s for the Book of Abraham manuscripts. Yeah, but in the 1830s, the church really didn't have a lot of money. Now the LDS oh, right. church has a lot of money. That's true, <laughs> that's, good that's point. The difference. But good okay, point. so you you have started, like, so how long have you been buying documents? Is that since you were in high school? Since? Yeah, since 1980, yes. Mm-hmm. So you have been, going around the country do you go to auctions do you knock on people's doors that look like they have old attics and important places like how do you find the documents i go to auctions i go to you know auctions in new york city or los angeles but i go to farm auctions in vermont or iowa i have been doing it for so long that the main way i get things is just from networking it's just that people know that i'll my i'll I'll make a competing bid and um, if someone finds something in great grandma's attic, they talk to someone who says, Hey, call this guy. He can hook you up. Right. Okay. And it isn't about resources. I don't have any more resources than anybody else. I just have a whole lot more care and, and, and uh, love for the documents. So I put, I put all of my resources into, into these items. And I assume you also have buyers. So you're able to, sell resell things i would assume do or do you i haven't sold you buy? no i keep i keep 99.9 percent of it i sell it on occasion if something isn't a good fit often if it's a utah item or a brigham young item or something i may i may let it go in order to get something else but it's it's to it's to make acquisitions so if i have to sell something that fits better in a utah institution then i would then i would let that go and i would use that those resources to maybe buy some Kirtland hymnals or something like that. Okay. Okay. So do you have, have, are you, or if I have duplicates? Yeah. I have duplicates of many, of many of the, I'm more interested in unique things. So if I have, if I have multiple copies of something, I can let one go too. Okay. Okay. Are you going to establish a museum at some point or um, like, like, don't you have, I mean, how many artifacts would you say you have? About 250,000. And my hope is that the collection gets segmented depending on uh, its category. Some is going to go to the University of Michigan's Clements Library. Some will go to the the Yale University's uh, Beinecke Library. And some will go to the Peabody Essex Museum. And it depends. So the Peabody Essex is where I'd like my Joseph Smith family materials to go. My James Strang materials I'd like to go well first to Yale. But if they already have it, then I want the duplicate to go to the University of Michigan. Okay. And if I have RLDS materials, I want them to go to Princeton. So I have I have it sort of divided. And if it's something I bought uh, more uh, 
it more investment quality, like like a Book of Mormon that I have too many copies of in an institution doesn't need because they have copies. I would probably sell when I retire, sell some Books of Mormon. Okay, so is this your full time job? Is this what you do full time? Well, I'm retired. I was doing some other things. Yes. Okay. So now you're doing it full time now that you've retired from your day job. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's good to understand. So, so I am really interested because, so the William Clayton diary is, you know, some of my listeners have said, what are you talking about with that? So can we discuss the importance of the William Clayton diary and um, what it is? Um, what, anyway, why it is such an important um, thing to our discussion of polygamy, but then to the broader discussion of Joseph Smith and what we can understand about him. It's probably as important as anything we don't know about. <laughs> um, when you say William Clayton diary, um, there are, you know, there's sort of, they've enumerated them as, as six diaries, but we refer to them as the the uh, first, the Manchester Diary. Um, he was a convert in 1840 in a town called Penwardham, I think is how you say it, Penwardham. Uh, and it's it's a little tiny town across the river from uh, Preston, where there was a lot of Mormon activity. And Preston is maybe 35 miles northwest of Manchester, which is where they were publishing the the Millennial Star Church newspaper in 1840. So that's really the center of Mormon activity. And then 35 miles to the southwest is Liverpool. And in Liverpool, they that's ultimately where they print the Book of Mormon in 1841 and the church hymnal in 1841. So that's where the activity is. It's up in the northwest of England. And so he's there in this little town. And so he starts his diary on January 1st, 1840. That's the first diary. The second that's diary. When he's converted. That's when he, he yeah. he's he's from. He would have an, a British accent. Yes. And oh yes. The church in England. Yes. Okay. Okay. So the second diary we call we call the Nauvoo diary. I'll pause on that. Hold off on that one for a second. That's the Nauvoo diary. It goes from. I, I know that's more, the. I have uh, one more quick question. Was William Clayton then? Because I know that Brigham Young and um, um, Heber C. Kimball were serving missions in Nauvoo. Were they the ones that converted him? They were his connection to the church. Do you know? Um, you know, the more I think about it, I think he might've been converted as early as 1837. Let me think. He's born November. Let's see. When was he born? He was born July 27th of 1814, I think. So he would have been, he would have been just about, he was three weeks. No, not 20, the 20th, I think. Try to remember so many dates. He's born, I think, the 20th of July. I could be wrong. The 20th of July, 1814. I so want to say just... I'm impressed because I struggle with all my kids' birthdays. So I'm amazed. Oh. So keep <laughs> He's going three ahead. weeks from turning 30 when Joseph Smith is killed. He's in his 20s when Joseph Smith is killed. So he's about 10 years, almost 10 years younger than Joseph. Uh, so he's converted in 1837. He would have been, you know, he was young like, like I was. Um, okay. Okay, so, sorry, continue. I just kind of wanted to make those connections and see, you know. Yeah, so he would have been, what, 23, people... I think. So 23, he's converted. And he marries okay. in 18. Um, he marries a, a woman, um, Moon. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Sarah Moon is the sister. And is it? it's not Nancy Moon. We can look no, it up. No, not Sarah. No, it's Margaret. and. Um, oh, Margaret Moon. Uh, <laughs> Margaret Moon. Uh, no, that's the mm -hmm. sister. Margaret Moon is the sister. And I just is... barely read through his affidavit, so I'm trying to remember the name. I used to know. I can't remember anymore. Yeah. But anyway, okay. he marries, ultimately, he marries two sisters. And well, first the one, and then and then yeah, and then the Ruth. Other. I'm sorry, Ruth. Ruth Moon. He married Ruth Moon in England, and he married Margaret Moon later. Okay. Okay. That's the, so, that's okay. the Manchester so diary, right? Then there's the Nauvoo okay. diary and the Nauvoo diary. So the Manchester diary goes through a little bit of the Nauvoo period, but when he becomes Joseph Smith's recorder, he starts another diary and that diary uh, runs from November 27th of 1842. Uh, and then it runs all the way through January 30th 
1846, but it covers 19 months of Joseph Smith's administration. It's covering Joseph Smith from exactly 19 months because it's starting from, from uh, November 27th through June 27th when June Joseph Smith. But exactly 19 months, that's super important to us. Not that the rest isn't important, not that the Manchester diary isn't important, but this Nauvoo diary it goes beyond Joseph Smith. But man, those 19 months, I really want to see. So um, then there's a third diary, uh, is really a Nauvoo temple record. He actually, after Joseph Smith's killed, keeps a record for Heber C. Kimball, and uh, it covers the period maybe December 10th through January 6th. So December 10th of 1845 through January 6th, they're doing the temple ordinances in Nauvoo. And so he keeps that record that we call the, the William Clayton diary number three, I guess you would call it. And then the fourth diary, you know, is a neat diary. It covers the Mormon trail. It covers from uh, when they leave Nauvoo. So February 8th through 1847. And then there's still two more diaries after that. He takes a mission with Brigham Young to Southern Utah, really Brigham Young's annual vacation, winter vacation. Uh, so in 1852, he keeps a diary for Brigham or for himself, but I mean, the Brigham mission is covered there, the Brigham vacation. And then in 1852, you know, they, they formally announce polygamy and publish the alleged revelation in Salt Lake City, and they've got a problem. So they've also printed it in, in in St. Louis and it's and it's in the newspapers and it's traveling. So William Clayton actually uh, takes off for England in 1852 on what we call the polygamy mission. And so he keeps a diary from from 1852 to 1853 for that mission. But then going back to this Nauvoo journal, it's not really one journal. It's actually three. There are three. Okay, I want to pause. I have one question. Nauvoo so diary is actually three. Okay, so when you say they had a problem and he went on a polygamy mission, I just wanted to specify that. Do you mean because word was getting out and they still wanted to keep it hush hush, and and so he went or he went to say no, polygamy is God's damage will. control. A little of both, I think. Damage okay. control, and it didn't okay. go that. It didn't go that well, but. That's another story. That's a long story. Okay. Okay. It's fascinating. So much to look into. Okay. So now back to the Navu diary. So this is his second diary and the one that we really, really, this is like the $10 billion diary, right? And it's three diaries. That, so that's where I interrupted you. It's three diaries and then maybe another little supplement. And it was probably, there are probably other pieces lost or hidden. We don't know, but uh, he starts the diary in November 20, November of 43. So November 27th of 40. No, I got that wrong. November 27th 42. of 40. And so he, uh, you know, it's a little white diary. It's about, it's what we call 16 mo. It's probably made up of sheets of 16 pages. And there's probably um, in that first one, I would guess eight gatherings. So it would be, um, it'd be 128 pages long. I would, I would judge the first diary is 128 pages long. It's about six inches tall, maybe four inches wide. Um, and yes. is it kind of like all of us, like he finishes his first diary and writes on the last page. And so he starts a new one. Is that how the other diaries go? It's hard to tell because I can't see the last page or I haven't seen the last page or the first page, but it's a little tiny ledger book. It's got a clasp. It's white, white Moroccan goatskin. Um, it's That's got the Navu it's really one? ledger book. So it's got red lines running vertically and super faint uh, blue lines going horizontally. And he writes in it until, oh, I think about the end of April of 44. Okay, and so but that is the one that- He changes the pen. And so one of the issues I look at is I'm not interested in a typed copy of the diary. I mean, I am, if that's all I can get, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a material culture historian. So I, I, I work with anything from seer stones to sunstones. I wanna know how they're made, what the, what the material is. I wanna know, uh, everything from Mormon sacred spaces and temples and architecture as 
cultural objects, everything from those to the photographs of them taken in the mid-century vernacular photography period of so, through 19th. So in oh, a I way, want... you're an archaeologist. You're an archaeologist as well, kind of, but of mo more modern history, like seeing all of the bit, the artifacts are, right. are your domain. Your microscopes. I want to know what kind of ink is used, how they're, how they're created, what kind of, what's in the margins. I want to look at the ink and see if it's layered. I want to, I want to understand a chronology of, of adding things to the document and and its whole creation process. It's about the creation. What what was the purpose? What was the, you know? So I'm looking at these diaries, and I'm not, I'm not seeing the same thing I see when I, I probably own a thousand diaries. You know, they're not all Mormon. Uh, they're sometimes contextual diaries. They may have just one mention of Mormonism. But people don't write diaries the way William Clayton did. William Clayton's diary is pretty clean. It doesn't. I'm not positive because I haven't had the opportunity to just go through every page but it doesn't look to me like like William Clayton's diary was written in the field you know as as diaries are written they're not written on a steamboat they're not written on a horse they're not written in a cabin you know they're written in an office and they appear to so be you're... I think he's written them he's written them in chunks, like he's gathered other documents and then written dozens of pages at a time from other source documents. So he's not sitting in a congregation writing down Joseph Smith's sermon. He's scribbling on some scratch paper or something. And a few weeks later, maybe he's he's doing this diary. And, you know, it's not it's even possible that the diaries are made much, much later. But I don't know. It's just too hard to tell. But I'm not real comfortable with the diaries. I'm not real comfortable, especially that they were they certainly weren't created. As he's walking or, or traveling with Joseph. OK, so so the critical thing about these diaries is they cover the most important 19 months of this history uh, in Mormonism especially for the discussion of polygamy, but many other things as well. And you know what they look like? Have you seen photographs of them or have they just been described? I've seen photographs and all of it described photographs. Okay. But you have not been allowed to hold them, touch them, read them, investigate them, look at them under a microscope, any of any, any actual archival work you haven't been able to do. Right. Okay. And so... So now I'm, I'm, I'm making sure I'm understanding what you're saying. So for me, when I have a journal, um, you know, sometimes maybe I'll keep it by my bed at night. But if I was doing that with candlelight, there might occasionally be a piece of ash on it. I might occasionally spill a little bit of tea on it. It might show wear and tear from being carried in my backpack or my pocket or right. So you're saying that when all of these journals you have, the diaries, you can tell that people were say, um, like Todd Compton said about Eliza Snow's journal, you can tell that she's writing it around the campfire that night. Sometimes their hand is tied. Sometimes they're more energetic. It's, it's sometimes the the wordings are a little sloppier because they were on a horse or whatever. You, you know, like you can see real life in the pages of the journal, and that's what a real um, working diary or journal would look like, as opposed to a document that is kept carefully preserved on a working desk that is written in a pristine way without crossing things out, without, you know, without the daily, um, we all know what journals look like, right? You get a thought later, like, and this is more a prepared document than it is a working journal. Is that, am I understanding the point you're making? Exactly. And it's, it's so that when we call, when we say we have the Nauvoo Journal, we're talking about three separate books. The first one I described goes uh, through about April or May of 1843, if I remember right. And then he starts another. Is that, is that no, he 1842? starts in 42 and he goes through. Uh, I might have some notes. Well, you, let's see. November 27th, 1842 is what you had said. Oh, oh, that's Joseph's. That's that's the journal that covers Joseph. Yeah, the end of the end of April, 1843. Okay. And this, so this is a little white journal. It's got marbled edges, red and blue, and and you can you can see it's got about 128 pages. 
I have some experience okay, so, with book construction, so I'm looking uh -huh. at it and I can I can probably guess it's about 128 pages, which would be eight gatherings. And then the, the subsequent one is probably twice as thick. I would judge it to be about a 16 gathering, so about 256 pages, 16 times 16. Okay, so his one novel, runs, oh, go ahead. That one then runs to September of 1844. So the second one covers the, the martyrdom, supposedly, we would we think. And then the third one then goes from September until, um, until January 30th, just before they leave for Utah. Okay, so these are, so why do we call it one journal? Is it just because it's the Nauvoo period journal? Because that sounds like three journals. It's almost like three volumes of a diary, but they're, they're really okay. all, it's really all almost 10 separate pieces. There's, there's also one final piece of 16 pages, just one gathering that is, nobody can account for why it's not in one of the other books. And it kind of shows you how they were, they were contriving this diary, it was, it was a, almost like a synthetic diary of, of entries that they were assembling, let's say. Okay, so I'm gonna break that down. Go like ahead. in the sense of plastic. I mean, synthetic, like in the sense of it's not created on a steamboat or on a horse or in a cabin or in a, you know. In so a, it's kind of like he has his working diary that he has on the steamboat and he brings all of those things together and then and makes this more pristine diary. Right. And so this other little piece of 16 pages, it covers from, oh, I can't remember, like June, like June 10th through June 22nd, maybe of 1844. And there's no explanation for why it isn't in the other uh, volume of his June of 1844 entries, or if it was meant to be tipped into the back. Maybe they used, maybe he used 256. I don't know. Nobody knows. Well, so so was that that little seg segment that we have? Um, are those dates missing from this journal, or no, they're dated. Was oh no, no. I mean, no, it's I mean, almost I mean, like overlap. It's um, it's more like overlap. So he kept two separate. He kept two separate accounts, or I don't know. But don't but know. The, the dates he has recordings in this in this real journal for the same dates, or at least at the same time period that we have this little segment. So yeah, there and there is... are people that know this. You know, James Allen is a is a ninety five year old historian who's worked with those diaries back in the nineteen eighties or seventies, probably starting in seventy four, maybe nineteen seventy four. James Allen and and uh, J that's James B. Allen. He worked for the Church History Department. And uh, his colleague, well, not uh, uh, the founder of Signature Books, George Smith, George D. Smith, was also a historian at that time. He's about 85 now. And he worked with the diaries, but he had to work with transcripts. So he's more like me. <laughs> and well, uh, but those guys, is... those guys probably know more about this than I do. But and there's people at the Justice Smith papers that probably know, but they're not talking. So well, I'm that's what I was going to say. My... I don't what know if I've anybody else would tell you it's a white diary or that, you know, the second volume is a chestnut colored diary and the second volume does not have the red ledger lines. Like I've kind of studied what these f look like physically to try to understand when I think they're created. I Oh, okay. Created in Utah, but it's, but it's, but it's probably at best they were created days after weeks after the entries. And by the okay. way, the first, that first volume from from November of 42 through through April of 43, that volume is in just two pens, it looks like. Like the first half is is a gray pen, it looks gray, and the second half is a darker black, thinner pen. It's like he used two pens to create this diary for six months, and, and it just switches halfway through. It just doesn't feel like it's just my instinct. It doesn't feel like other diaries I look at that change continuously. Okay. Okay. So, so for so many reasons, the William Clayton diary is like a big deal. First of all, it's never been released. My understanding is that James Allen, who was the one who got to work with it, and that's my understanding too, and you said that, he's been really faithful to the church and not given us you know like he hasn't he hasn't he my understanding is he didn't even really want his paper published didn't want it talked about he just wanted to keep it under wraps and and so so 
based on oh what's the word in law and anyway you can like if 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 evidence is not forthcoming we can assume that there might be a reason why right like it is suspicious that we're not able to see these journals it causes some suspicion and the reason it's important to me or to us you know like there's so much information but William Clayton's journal is considered one of the best evidences for jo Joseph's polygamy as I understand it, because we do have some transcripts from it that claim that Joseph, that, that record some of his marriages. And so that's one of the solid contemporaneous pieces of evidence that, that we use to say absolutely he was participating in polygamy. But you're saying that you are, you are suspicious that it is a motivated creation of some sort, possibly. Am I, am I saying that too? Anyway, I'll let, you, I'll let you respond to what I've tried to sum up if I'm getting it right. Yeah, so here's where I struggle. There's a discourse of 26th of May, 1844, that's in the Joseph Smith papers. It's compiled by Leo Hawkins, Leo Hawkins is, has made a copy, doubtlessly, because Leo Hawkins isn't in the church in 1844. This is an 1856 document, but it's a very moving discourse of Joseph Smith. It's the one where he says, um, it's the one where he says. Uh, is it, I have rattled chains and dudges for the truth's sake? Is it that one? Yeah, he says, um, I'm the same man and innocent as I was 14 years ago. I can prove them all perjurers. Um, Isn't this his last public discourse that we have record of where he says, what a thing it is for a man to be accused of having seven wives when I'll, I can only find one. That's that. Thank summer, you. You've right? got it memorized. I'm trying to find that entry. So I, I can, my yeah, last here episode, it is. I just. Yes, here okay. it is. What a thing it is for a man to be accused of committing adultery or committing. Uh, hold on adultery and having seven wives when I can only find one. I'm the same man and as innocent as I was 14 years ago and I can prove them all perjurers. Now, I want to I want to call your attention to a couple of neat things in this discourse. First of all, this discourse is moving. He's passionate. If for anybody who's ever been accused of anything, you can feel it in this document. He is indignant. He is mad. He is innocent and he is defensive, but he's not too defensive like Shakespeare would say. You know, he's not protesting too much, but he's specifically he's saying- He's making his case. He's, a, he's, he's, he's passionately he's, making his case. He's almost making his opening argument here before any potential trial. And, you know, he says, I haven't, I, I, I'd not been married scarcely five minutes and made one pro proclamation of the gospel before, I'd, before it had been reported I had seven wives. You know, that's talking about 1827 when he marries Emma. He's already being accused of polygamy in 1827. But what I really love about this document, yeah, you know, more of what you just said, uh, a man, this new holy prophet, William Law, has gone to Carthage and swore that I had told him I was guilty of adultery, the spiritual wifeism. Why a, ma a man dares not speak or wink for fear, for fear of being accused of this. Well, notice that William Law is swearing. He's making affidavits. This is just like in the 1880s when you get the affidavits. But what Joseph Smith says in this document that's so moving to me is when he says, God is in the still small voice. In all these affidavits, indictments, it is all of the devil. All corruption. Come on, ye prosecutors, ye false swearers. I don't understand how a historian can read that and then say, but we have an affidavit in the 1880s that says he was a polygamist. And you would take that affidavit over this. I mean, Joseph Smith is just extraordinary in here. But here's what I'm getting at with how this connects for me with the William Clayton Diaries. It's this, this paragraph. For the last three years, this is how he's going to prove he's innocent. Okay. Right. Joseph says, I'm going to prove myself innocent. And this is how. For the last three years, I have kept a record of all my acts and proceeding. For I have kept several good, faithful, and efficient clerks in constant employ. And they have accompanied me 
everywhere and carefully kept my history. And they have written down what I have done, where I have been, and what I have said. They cannot charge me, therefore my enemies cannot charge me with any day or time or place, but what I have written testimony to prove my actions and my enemies, for they cannot prove anything against me. So what was the purpose of William Clayton's diary? The purpose of William Clayton's diary was to exonerate Joseph Smith of polygamy. It's not that there's polygamy in the diary, it's that there are entries in that diary. If that diary is authentic, there's only two possibilities. Either that diary is authentic and it exonerates Joseph Smith of polygamy, or William Clayton was one of the perjurers who was creating the diary and Joseph Smith alludes to several- That was my thought. So either, either, Jos either that diary has exculpatory evidence that would exonerate Joseph Smith at trial. And there should be four, by the way. Joseph Smith has got like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's got people recording to testify for him. So, and, oh, so we don't have these the journals. Clayton these journals should were, all be there. The William Clayton diaries were created for the purpose of exonerating Joseph Smith against the, that's what Joseph is saying. They're created to exonerate me from the charge of polygamy. So if William Clayton is writing in there, things like, like William Clayton writes that he married his two sisters, the two sisters, he married Ruth Moon, and then he married Margaret Ruth Moon, and then he wanted to marry Lydia Moon, the mother. And he writes in the diary that Joseph Smith objected because Joseph wanted to marry Lydia, the mother. So William Clayton is either, if that's in there, William Clayton, and that's actually an 1844 entry, then William Clayton wrote it in 1844 for the purpose of getting Joseph Smith indicted. The word, okay, so that was... Okay, so that was my thought. So this this kind of pristine journal that he's writing on a desk while he's keeping other notes somewhere else, like what you're hypothesizing, it, which, and, and I know if even if this sounds extreme to people, we have to know there were conspirators. Like I think that William Law started his journal for the same purpose to try to keep a record against Joseph. And, and right, so- right. So it's completely possible that William Clayton was sort of manufacturing an alternative journal to justify his polygamy as having come through Joseph is is what that is one of the options. So either there's a journal when William Clayton was following Joseph around for real that would exonerate Joseph or this more carefully cr crafted journal is an attempt to frame Joseph. Right. They're either framing Joseph or they're exonerating Joseph. And Joseph says he's not guilty of polygamy and he's got scribes and clerks that are going to help him prove it. In the meantime, William Clayton is writing in his diary and, and William Law are they writing in their diaries that Joseph Smith is making these statements, but they're just these little innuendos and and short little things. There's no, hey, I attended the 50th wedding today or the 40th wedding or the 38th wedding or the 33rd wedding, depending on which new Mormon historian you ask. But there's no 50 weddings that William Clayton goes to. There's just these little, you know, Joseph and I were arguing about who is going to get Lydia, Lydia Moon. I don't. Okay. I have so many questions. So, so the, 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 um, speech you just were referring to and just reading from the um, May 26th, I think, 1844, that it was recorded by Thomas Bullock, did you say? And or No, this is Leo Hawkins. It's a Leo, Leo Hawkins. Hawkins. Okay. It might come out of George A. Smith's journal, which I've seen, but which other historians are not aware of. It's in private hands. Okay. Uh, so you would... We would think that William Clayton would be recording jo Joseph's sermons in his journals. And we don't have the account of that sermon in William Clayton's journal. Like we are using this other one instead. Isn't the earliest that copy we have is 1856. Right. So that. Remember, brings... there's other there's other people, too. You know, just think of how many scribes there were. You've got you've got James Sloan, James Whitehead, you've got Willard Richards. Um, we can't see his diary either. Uh, we can see some of his. Uh, we've got um, 
Oh, I made a list last night of just off the top of my head how many scribes Joseph had. Um, okay, so what I just talked about in the episode I did on um, the RLDS is when he says to William Marks about polygamy, I have been de I have been deceived. And I think William Marks, my opinion is he misunderstood that to think Joseph was saying, I've been deceived about polygamy. I think what he was saying was, I have been deceived by these people that I trusted, like William Clayton to be my scribe or like my leaders of the elders quorum. Do you know what I mean? So we and we know that Joseph in speeches said that his friends were conspiring to take his life. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I just want to want to like this might seem to some people. I mean, it is a conspiracy. We are conspiracy theorists because this world has conspiracies when people. Right. Right. Like so. So what we are saying, we know that William Clayton had these sisters, at least. Right. Margaret and Ruth Moon, his wife's sister. And. So he very possibly could have been and his journal is not a working journal it does not look like all of the other journals look we have not been given access to anything to be able to dig into it so so if will so and joseph was the one who assigned them to keep journals so he could say i'm not a polygamist joseph's entire reason for saying i want these scribes to follow me around and keep my journal was so that he could verify that he was not a polygamist. oh you'll take a guy so, like brian hales yes and the argument is we don't have any polygamy documents because they were commanded to burn them yet but yet Joseph Smith's scribes are supposed to be following him around to record that he was polygamous. That would be what would exonerate him. Right. He's getting he's getting exonerated. You would think if that if if William Clayton's diary was faked, that it would that it would that Brian Hales would argue would make the argument that um, that Joseph Smith was a polygamist and and. William Clayton faked a diary to say he wasn't. Like, why is right. William Clayton writing things down that can get, can put, get Joseph Smith put in prison? So Joseph, the entire reason he had people follow him around to keep a diary for him from his own speech was to say, I'm not a polygamist. And we have James Whitehead and a few other diarists. Well, at least James Whitehead saying, I kept a diary and he had no other wives. No other woman came and asked for money. No other woman had records. Like I saw him and Emma as husband and wife and no other. So we have other people keeping diaries that can attest to that. We have Thomas Joseph Bullock, Smith himself. Have, where are these diaries that exonerate Joseph Smith? Are there any? Right. So either those were destroyed Either those were destroyed by the conspirators painting him as a polygamist or they're being kept under lock and key. And because we know that there was there were revisions done to history. We know that they were trying to, you know, I'm, I'm going to get into that more and more. So so by Joseph Smith's own testimony of why he had people following him around, his entire purpose was to prove that he was not. A pol participating in polygamy. So there is right. no logical reason that William Clayton would have a valid diary recording anything about polygamy. Right. It's, it's got, wrong okay. either way. It's wrong either way. Wow. Okay. So either it's being kept under lock and key because it would exonerate him and we want all the other diaries as well. They either, Joseph himself testified that he had these diaries kept. They either were destroyed or they're being hidden, they're being kept because they would right, exonerate right. him. Or right. on the other hand, and, and then the one that we do have that does exist, that we do know about is most, the one that does implicate him in polygamy is too beautiful of a, it, it's a created. Um, it's certainly an office journal. It's an office journal at best, right? Maybe even a fair copy, meaning they prepared it for other purposes later, copying from and, the person. And in any case, Joseph would absolutely not have approved of it or avowed it. He would have not said, yes, that is my actual journal. See, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, my brain is doing all these things because also we claim that all of the documents were burned and there are no records because they couldn't keep them because it was illegal and we say all that. Well, at the same time, there's this journal being kept that does record polygamist information. Like, how does that make any sense? 
Oh my gosh, you've blown my mind. Okay, this is really cool. So thank you for help for taking the time to help me really understand what you have put together. That is fascinating. This conspiracy was deep and people were up to it, were into it up to their eyeballs. Okay. So, okay, go ahead. I'm equally Sorry. uncomfortable with W.W. Phelps and, and Willard Richards. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you have any The whole podcasts. Well, I mean, I buy documents from these guys, you know, this is, uh, there's Phelps acting as recorder for Joseph. So, you know, personally, their funny. handwriting, their style. Oh, They're, sure. Like, yeah. Yeah. I can them. show you documents from, you know, William Clayton as recorder. And what you're holding up. This is amazing. I wish I were there because this isn't the Joseph Smith's pa papers. You're, this is the actual document. These are the Joseph holding. Smith papers. Yes. I, I mean, I mean, we're not just seeing pictures of them. These are the originals. Well, these are William Clayton's own uh, own papers from his own, some of them. Okay, so this is a, so this is a letter you, addressed to William Clayton. While you're holding this up, you let know, me ask he's doing you. a lot of recording. So William Clayton does, you know, a thousand documents. I don't even get the whole William Clayton thing because William Clayton did not have great handwriting. Neither did Willard Richards. These guys got into the confidence of Joseph Smith a lot like W.W. W. Phelps did. You know, W.W. W. Phelps got the press destroyed in independence. He got the Book of Commandments destroyed. He said things in the in the church newspaper that were. So is he, W.W. W. Phelps sort of was the one that kind of framed Joseph for, like he, he convinced Joseph to destroy the press and then also possibly informed the authorities that, it, it, never Oh, mind. in Nauvoo, he, yeah. So yeah, but going back, I'm still in Missouri. So in 1838, oh, he gets okay. Joseph Smith put in the Liberty Jail. I mean, how do you get Will, Joseph Smith put in the Liberty Jail and then still like snake your way into Joseph Smith's confidence again in Nauvoo and then get him put into Carthage Jail and be there on the day of the martyrdom and and then have all this i mean that's a whole other that's a whole episode william clayton is uh, okay person long before he played the devil in the temple but okay so let me ask <laughs> let me ask you this so you with your like depth oh, of, so nice. of um of understanding of who Joseph was like you were able to re just just by reading Mark Hoffman's documents you were like that's not Joseph you just knew that wasn't Joseph so you really are well acquainted with him do and and you just read his um, May 26th impassioned sermon do you think that Joseph was having you know, was telling William Clayton, it's your privilege to have as many wives as you want. Do you, do you like, like my understanding of who Joseph is, how I finally kind of came to this was studying Emma and Joseph and their lives. And then also looking at how Joseph, I, I am convinced Joseph genuinely believed his revelations and did his best to live them. What, what God revealed to Joseph, he tried to implement and tried to obey. So when I look at 132, it like, I'm not as familiar with Joseph as you are, but it certainly doesn't sound like Joseph to me. And he completely ignored it and didn't live according to it at all. Right. And so I guess my question, sorry, it was a very loaded question. I didn't mean to go off. I just, I get a little impassioned as well. Do you think 132 is Joseph Smith? Do you think Joseph was practicing polygamy, trying to keep it secret, making secret deals with like, like using Heber C. Kimball's daughter, Helen, to seal them to get, do you, do you, does this ring true to you? All these later te testimonies and affidavits of what Joseph was doing on the sly. Is that who Joseph was? No. That's it. <laughs> Done. Okay. <laughs> Um, 132, it, you know, that's not, it doesn't ring true. It doesn't ring like Joseph Smith's voice. It doesn't ring like Joseph Smith's revelations. It's not, uh, it doesn't have the correct historical context. It, um, obviously we don't have a contemporary copy. We have the, the Kingsbury copy because the best we can do. Um, I'm not buying it, but you know, my job is to be a skeptic. So if, you know, if that had turned up in any other, era, you know, you would tell a, a rare book depository not to buy that. You wouldn't, a repository, you wouldn't, you, you tell somebody to buy that document, I would tell them it's not authentic. It's Okay. 
It's not an it's not a genuine Nauvoo document. Okay, so okay, so if if you had had the the ear of the church leaders in 1981 or 1980, you would have been saying to them, "Nope, don't those, those are forgeries. Don't buy those." Documents. Oh, I thought we were talking about 132, but yeah, same thing. I know. I'm, I'm I'm making a comparison. I'm saying that in 1980, you would have told them, "No, don't buy." that and if you could right. and 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 you're doing the same thing if you had the ear of anyone now just in the same yes. way you would say no that's not a yeah, genuine but document but i'd say the same thing about the leo hawkins sermon the leo hawkins sermon is not a genuine Nauvoo document but it does ring in the voice of joseph smith as to use that word again it it sounds like joseph smith if you spend and i'm sure any other person in the joseph smith papers project would agree this doesn't seem uh, the Leo Hawkins document, which probably comes from George A. Smith, is not a, it doesn't sound like a folk document. It's not folklore. It's not a Victorian storytelling document. It's a likely uh, early copy of a, of a genuine document. Well, and also nobody can, I think that everyone agrees with you. I've never heard that contested. I've, I've heard, I hear it explained away as a um, carefully worded denial, which I think is ludicrous, but I've never heard anyone say, no, Joseph didn't say that it's a forgery because there's no, so, so I guess what I'm saying is we can take the Leo Hawkins document and say, yes, this is, this is valid Joseph Smith. From everything we know of Joseph Smith, this sounds like him. It's got the ring. We can see, say where it probably came from. It'd be, get, it'd be great if we could get an earlier copy of it, but, in, but we have no reason to doubt this is Joseph Smith, whereas 132 does not pass that test. Correct. But that's okay. a, subjective, a, a subjective opinion. My my. You know, I'd like to be able to just say that's not a genuine Nauvoo document, but my subjective opinion having, so that's an objective opinion. We know it's not a Nauvoo document. Um, subjectively, we can say, and it doesn't sound like Joseph Smith at all. Right. And I, I'm aware that I'm asking you for your subjective opinion, but I'm doing it as possibly the greatest expert we know of, of Joseph Smith's voice and Joseph Smith's writings. And I don't know anyone else that can quote line and verse of the times and seasons for the entire history of the church. So I'm saying you are- Well, the Joseph familiar... Smith papers people are really good historians. I just don't okay. think they have the academic freedom to do this kind of work, or maybe they're in the new Mormon history school of thought, but they're, but there are better historians than me. But thank okay. you, that's so nice. Well, let's take a minute to talk about this new Mormon historian um, as you are talking about it. So can you explain what you mean by that? I mean, I know we have the term, but how are you using the term new Mormon historian? And let's kind of talk about that because the Mormon hist the Nor Mormon narrative right now is very much that God did want polygamy. Now he doesn't want polygamy, but we still believe it kind of depending on who you talk to anyway so so our historians you're talking about are you including brian hales are you including um why is my brain brain going blank rough stone rolling um bushman are you who, like who are you including in that is it the entire historical department and can you define what you mean by it Okay, so you were telling me that the new mormon history started in about 1902 or at least that school of thought. You and I also want you to, it, so, mm -hmm. I also want you to explain what that school of thought is. I want you to tell me what, what they mean by it or what you mean by it. So let me, let me make sure it's clear. These are really good historians. This is just a school of thought and in scholarship and academia, people develop new traditions and new historiology type techniques. And this is just a technique that that developed in kind of almost, you, it's probably not completely unique to Mormonism, but in Mormon history, you had a real protagonist antagonist uh, dualism taking place and people wanted to make their books more credible. So they wanted to say that uh, our book is impartial. That's just marketing, right? Again, it's like essential oils, like what a great marketing phrase, essential oils or common sense gun control. Who can disagree? <laughs> so who can disagree with a phrase like new Mormon history? Um, that's what they thought. And so they coined that term in the late mid century, maybe 1966, I don't know, maybe 1970. And it was the Richard Bushman camp. Now, 
again, he's the patriarch of Mormon history. He's good. He knows his material. He's very well credentialed um, at, at the university, you know, level. But I would argue he's sort of a cubicle and classroom historian where I'm a document historian. I'm a material culture historian. I'm out digging sunstones out of the mud and he's teaching class classes and reading papers. But I'm reading so the papers So both sides too. are important. Both sides are important. Oh, sure. You just yeah. have a hands-on grittiness of of like you have the physical doc the 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 physical side of it, I guess. The more like hands-on I know what this is side of it. That that's Well, important. yeah, there's so so we live in a flat screen society where people will decide if a daguerreotype purporting to be Joseph Smith is Joseph Smith by, by looking at it on a flat screen. They look at all their Mormon history on a flat screen and they write their Mormon history uh, using documents on flat screens. So you, they, and it's, by the way, it's unethical. It's unethical to take a typescript of the New York Tribune from July uh, 8th, 1844, and cite it and say you looked at it if you're only looking at a typed copy on the internet. Or even if you're even if you're using a microfilm copy, it should be stated what media you looked at. If you didn't look at the New York Tribune, you didn't look at the New York Tribune, right? But that's how Mormon history is decided. So you don't look at the daguerreotype to decide if it's an authentic daguerreotype. You simply say, looks like Joseph Smith to me. And I don't know why a historian like say Ben Park would, or I don't know why that I don't know why the Salt Lake Tribune would interview Ben Park for his opinion on whether that's a daguerreotype if he hadn't ever seen it. You know, so that's okay. kind of how Mormon history is done. You can look at a picture of Joseph Smith and say, well, I'm a I'm a PhD credentialed historian. I've written a book about Nauvoo, so you know, I, I my my opinion is valued. Uh, one would say uh, because of your credentials. Um, but I disagree. Okay. I think you have to look at things as objects. I want to see these documents as objects. I want to see 132. I want to see it in, you know, at least William Clayton's handwriting. We don't even have that in William Clayton's handwriting. So, so you, you bring to it, oh, this is what I'm trying, what I'm hearing. There's the question of authentication as well as many other things. And so so if what I'm what I'm hearing is like here's a daguerreotype, someone says it's a daguerreotype, then it's accepted as a daguerreotype and no one's allowed to ask that question again. So we just do our history based on one person's maybe not that well informed opinion that that's a daguerreotype, then it's accepted and it becomes factual. And so what you're saying is you want to do the actual work of going is there a Mark Hoffman forgery in here? Is this a forgery by someone else? It's not even just a forgery, but like, like what, what can I find out? You want to look at it as someone trying to find forgeries, but, but much more beyond that, trying to get a sense of what's going on here in a bigger picture than just saying, oh, this is what this says. This is what this says. This is what this says. It's accepted. So it's accepted. And we don't even know who right. was the Right. who how we are we're not we're not welcomed into that process of deciding what should be accepted on what terms right but we, but it's remember it's not just whether or not it's an authentic document so 132 is not an authentic Nauvoo period document that doesn't mean it's right. for well it is a forgery but uh the Hoffman things are forgeries but but you know when we're looking at the diaries of William Clayton from Nauvoo those three journals uh or all the journals nine or ten um, we're, we're looking at them not just to see whether or not they're authentic, but we're looking at them to right. see for what purpose they were created, when they were created, how they were edited, how they were altered, how they were preserved, what uh, the provenance is, what, you know, we were looking for context. We're being right. detectives more than just historians because we're right. saying what was the motive here? How, what was the manner in which it was done? What was the purpose it served if someone had a purpose? So right. so we're not saying, did William Clayton really write this journal in 1844? That's not the question. The question is, is what William wrote in this journal in 1844 a true record of what Joseph Smith did? That's right. Well, question. he might he might have written it in 1847. I, it's not a forgery, but he might have written it himself in 1847. He might have written it in 1845. He might have written it in July of 1844. It it we have to understand how that how that was created. But the problem with the New Mormon historians is the New Mormon historians are very flat in their assessment, and the reason is is that they 
wanted to take that protagonist antagonist dualism and they wanted to uh, accept all viewpoints. So it's the, it's, the, it's the idea of almost like a Wikipedia article where you're trying to create a consensus and everybody can come in and edit until, until the dust settles and you have, you have a synthesized cons con consensus of what most, uh, what, what, what the generally accepted or widely accepted viewpoint of each thing is. So it's where you get um, Richard Bushman saying that Joseph Smith used both a seer stone and a Urim and Thummim and no tool at all at three different parts, three different stages of the translation of the Book of Mormon. Because he's, and that's based on us having three different accounts. Because from he's got to take that... each account and he's got to accept them all because he's not allowed. In their school of thought, you're not allowed to say that's anti-Mormon. We don't believe that. But when you but that's a slippery slope. So once you start saying that, you can't okay. really dismiss anything. You can't it, it, except if there's sometimes if there's a conflict, you might take a Utah centric viewpoint. So if you've got Eliza R. Snow uh, juxtaposed against Emma Smith, then you're going to take the Eliza Snow. You're going to take the Utah centric. By the way, I love this. I found this last night reading uh, in the Joseph Smith papers. I don't know if people are generally aware of this, but you'll enjoy this. This is a poem from Eliza R. Snow, the 12th of October, 1842. Did you know she wrote Joseph Smith a poem? In I've heard about this. Okay. She secretly married Joseph in June of 1842, but in July, a thousand female members of the church signed an affidavit saying Joseph Smith isn't teaching polygamy. And in October, uh, she publishes a certificate that denounces polygamy and denies Joseph Smith's. But those, we kind of know about that, but I didn't know about this poem. There's a lot I don't know. This poem is great. She's actually writing to Joseph Smith and she addresses him as President Smith. How is she his wife? I don't know. In October when was this 18, written? October so of 1842. So and read us the poem. Oh, the poem's not that it great. Long? It's not worth reading. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay. It's the manuscript of it exists in the Joseph Smith papers. And so it's four months after she's okay. married to Joseph Smith. And she's just writing, writing in presidential poetry addressed to President Oh, so it's Smith. not a, it's, when you say a poem, that makes us think a love poem. No, it's a no, very, no, no, okay. No, it's, 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 no it's in fact, she writes very... about Emma. She says, she says, uh, President Smith, sir, for your consolation, permit me to tell that your Emma is better. She soon shall be well. And then she goes on and she says, um, then pray for your Emma, but indulge not a fear for the God of our forefathers smiles on us here. So she's writing to Joseph about Emma. Didn't, didn't she yeah. throw Emma down the stairs or was that her or? No, vice versa. Right. Okay. That, I'm not see, a polygamy historian because just so fair warning. I'm not an expert in things that happened after July 27th, 1844. And almost everything about polygamy comes after it's all these affidavits. And I just, I just never paid any attention to them. I immersed myself in the, in the Joseph Smith documents and the, and the, you know, the times and seasons or the church periodicals and things. So I didn't, uh, okay. I, I don't know a whole lot about Eliza. Arsenal. But I do know that the watch she showed around was not, I, I, I always want to make that clear to people, was not a gift from Joseph Smith. She just took that off the Relief Society table. It was a man's watch. It was Joseph's watch. It wasn't like a, like a romantic, you know, when she would okay. show that all, all over Utah and say, I have a watch from Joseph Smith. She, it wasn't a gift from Joseph Smith. She just, Joseph Smith left it at the Relief Society meeting where they were keeping time and she took it and never gave it back. Apparently never had an opportunity to give it back from 1842 to 1844. Okay, so I want to know how you know that. Is that in a document somewhere? Yeah, you have to kind of parse through her, her speeches okay. about it and you realize that she's talking about a watch she took, not a watch that she got as a gift. It's a man's watch. It's Joseph Smith's watch. Okay, there is so much to learn to dig into. So, okay, I have to back up to your new Mormon history, so I remember to ask my questions. So I want to redefine it for you, and you tell me if I've got, if I've gotten it right. So what I'm 
understanding is the pitfalls of history are either that we're doing a very biased history. So we're doing like either a whitewash or we're trying to prove a case through our historical work. And then to try to counter that, they say, no, we're going to be unbiased, which means we're going to treat each source fairly and, and we're not trying to use history to make a religious ca case or whatever other case we're trying to make. But the danger on that is then you all of a sudden lose any ability to either prioritize or to, you know, you, then all of a sudden the danger is everything is valid and everything is true. And everything we accept it all exactly. at face value. So, right. Exactly. And so the problem there is because that's kind of my approach has been. I want to get in and understand who these people are and from every source I can find that is not disputed, that is firsthand, and then put myself in their shoes the best I can and say, what's going on? Like, that's really what I was doing with Emma and seeing the letters she was writing to Joseph. And if these things were true, she would not be writing those letters to Joseph, for one example, you know? Right. And so I and think that there versa. is... vice versa. Where are the letters? Oh, yes. absolutely. Absolutely. But yeah. that's what I mean. Their love story tells a very different story than... And, you know, the... Like, I call it the crazy Emma narrative. That was that was not how she was viewed in Nauvoo. She wasn't this crazy, well, you know, mentally ill, oh, unstable... Emma was elegant. Emma was elegant and sophisticated. But look... Highly you, respected. Poli Folklore is actually a thing. You know, there are universities that have departments. I think even BYU has a has a honorary professorship or something. Maybe there's an associate professor down there that I mean, they have people that work with folklore, but they don't stop and think about this as folklore. They might think of some parts of Mormon history as folklore, like did did um did Cain visit uh David W. Patton might be folklore you know, but they don't understand what's happening in Utah is there's a body of folklore. And by the way, you know, using uh, pre uh, presentism, you know, to try to, to try to understand uh, ethics, literary ethics in the, in the Victorian age, the Victorian age had a storytelling uh, part to it. That's how things were shared. That's how you persuaded people. And so the ethics I, I mean, I love, believe it or not, I love Eliza Snow. I mean, she, I love her family. I love the story. I love her I love too. That she's Italian. I love so much about her. I just think. I think she's brilliant. She's, she I love loves her words. Her brother, I love words. Uh, and I love her brother, Lorenzo. So that isn't what it is. I don't, I don't think of her as a dishonest person. I think of her as a storyteller. She's part, and it's okay we... then. So that's what they did in the, in that period when Queen Victoria was queen uh, for that, especially the last 60 years of the 19th century and, and peaking there in the same time they're signing those affidavits, it was okay to tell a story if you knew you were right. Okay. Well, that's what it is. Think of me as a good thing. So I'm going to say that Joseph Smith was my husband and then my friends and family will accept it. And that's considered, that was actually socially acceptable. Okay, that's that's what I was going to say. That's the same thing, the, the way I've been approaching it. We are the ones putting this literalness onto it. Yes. When yes. what they were doing, I think was saying, like I can see being told, we need to protect the kingdom. Polygamy is true. Joseph was a polygamist, but we need you to claim, we need you, we need you to help us prove this case. So the moral thing to do would be to, obey you had covenanted to obey your husband your prophet husband told you that god needed you to do this you're going to do it from a from a moral place thinking that was the moral thing to do and so it's our mistake as like sort of our present mistake is thinking that their writing is the same as what we mean we mean literally factually true not trying to prove a case. Yes. And so it's good. I think it's good to be unbiased. You know, I, I think we, I try to minimize my um, motivated reasoning as much as possible, try to recognize it. And, you know, but there is still a case for discernment to say this document makes the most sense in this way. This makes, you know, and, and at least to present that in your, in your writing to say, we have this claim, we have this claim, not this is the story of Joseph Smith, which includes all of those claims and just present it as factually true that he used right. is that what is that what you're saying 
Yeah, and I just think that that Mormon folklore needs to be embraced. I think that the church would actually have an out that way uh, because well, we've added the. We're I would starting just say to add the as a social experiment. And you look, there are a hundred books, a hundred thick books about polygamy written between between 1842 and, and 1902. There is a, a rich body of folk literature and storytelling and newspaper um, uh, columnists, uh, correspondents that are visiting Utah besides that. And I mean, such a rich story of the, the, the women's studies, uh, women's experience in Utah, women's experience with polygamy, but there's storytelling on both way, on both sides. And you, you have to not be ashamed of it, but embrace it. It's a, it's a important part of our culture. I don't, I don't think that people should be ashamed, be ashamed of Mormon polygamy. I think it's a, the Utah story is a great story, but you know, but section 132 isn't an authentic document. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That's, and, and we get in our own way because we still have, I think, I agree with you that it just embracing, we, we just, I think we get in our own way because we have this, the prophet can never lead us astray. So we need to have, you know, we need, somehow we can throw out all of other, all of Brigham Young's other teachings or most, you know, his unique doctrines. We've, we've discarded all of those. And yet for some reason, it's harder for us to let go of polygamy. Have, maybe. This is not my house, but I have oil paintings of Brigham Young and John Taylor made while they were alive. They sat for the portraits. You know, I love Brigham Young and John Taylor. I just love them as, as historic figures and in the context that I love them. I, I think that they, that they had a level of sincerity in, in certain ways. I don't, I don't, they were I, I can't, great I men. can't get rid of Brigham Young. You have to, you have to love that part of our history because it's our culture. I don't think that this, the, these things we're talking about are things that people should leave any church for. I think that they're, that they're problems, but I think that we can love our, we can love the mistakes in our history in the way that I would love Thomas Jefferson, despite his romantic relationship with one of his servants, uh, one of his slaves. Uh, which, which is still up for grabs. I have to throw in because people are going to are going to comment and I say, know. "But that's not true." It was his sister. So, but what I'm yeah. saying is, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter right. to me. I mean, I'm going to love. I'm going to love liberty and freedom and independence and privacy. And I'm going to love Thomas yes. Jefferson. And I'm going to love and I, Young. And I'm going to love John Taylor. And I even love William Clayton. <laughs> I brought some of his hymns with me today. <laughs> okay, I want to so, so and I just just building on what you were saying, I completely agree with you. I think that um I actually love seeing how God is is doing constant course corrections. We did get rid of polygamy. That did fulfill the prophecies of stopping the persecutions that the saints had suffered the whole time they were living it. We did like we do we God is still working with his people in all of the different um, places that he's planted us, right? I include you in that. Like, I think that we all are the inheritors of this beautiful legacy that God restored through Joseph Smith. And and so I don't think we have to, I think that this all or nothing thinking is a mistake. I say that often, but yes. seeing that, that polygamy was never true and that there was this, I mean, was never of God and that there was this conspiracy does not mean therefore throw it all out. I, I don't no. think that at all. There's no. a lot of beauty and goodness and truth that is worth preserving. So what's happening in Nauvoo is there's a camp of people that are pro polygamy, and there there's a struggle over polygamy in Nauvoo, and there are people that rise in leadership that have a history in some of the. I went on so many tangents. I'm so sorry, but I was talking about the restoration uh, that was taking place in Vermont for 25 years and in Western New York. We call that, or they called it then, or we called it then, the burnt district. Now they call it the burned over district, but the burnt district was part of that. Uh, Alexander Campbell and Sidney Rigdon and Kirtland were part of that. And, and so in that, in that tradition or that, you know, we were, we were struggling with uh, the traditional religions of the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the, and the Methodists and the Congregationalists um, they were coming out of those traditions in Vermont and Massachusetts, and they were they were discovering that they could learn for themselves, like we're learning now. And 
And they're doing this in Western New York, so they call it the burnt district. There's lots of revivals until nobody, there's nobody left to convert, right? Um, but, but some of those people in that restoration thing, that's all the way from Maine through Vermont, all the way to Kentucky, some of those people were polygamists. And so this, when you get together a whole lot of people who don't wanna be Baptist, Presbyterians or Congregationalists or even Unitarians or, or, or uh, Congregationalists, you're gonna get people that are thinking for themselves. And when people think for themselves, they're gonna say, well, why can't we have polygamy? Why can't we have a temple? So you're gonna see some parallels in Mormonism and other groups that are gonna range from, from Maine to um, Kentucky and certainly in Western New York in that burnt district. And so uh, then when you have the struggle in Nauvoo, you have to look at it like a business historian would look at the history of American businesses. You have a first generation entrepreneur, somebody like Elon Musk. Joseph Smith is like Elon Musk. OK, and he's partners with the Whitmers. So you have two family partnerships. You've got two founding families. You've got a founding father, two founding fathers, Father Whitmer and Father Smith. And you've got two founding mothers, you know, Mother Whitmer and Mother. Did I say that already? Mother, Mother, Whitmer Mother and Father Smith, Whitmer, Lucy. They called them. That's what they called them. And so the mm -hmm. Whitmers kind of get pushed out and then it's the Smiths. And then they push the Smiths out a lot like you will see eventually Elon Musk get pushed out. People the first generation creative uh, people as a business model are like Joseph Smith as a, in his prophetic role. And I think that mm -hmm. the people that came along, that came from England with, with uh, Heber C. Kimball, John Taylor, Brigham Young, uh, Willard Richards, you know, they, they are the, they're like the MBAs that come and take over the family owned business. Okay. Not that, not, not that I'm saying the church was a business. That's not what I mean at all. No, but it's sort of just a comparison. Cultural, how 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 humans uh, uh, react in culture. You're you're seeing a second generation of people, a second management generation, come in and think that Joseph Smith needs to shut up, and they 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 did a coup. They take over the church and they and they bring with it their ideas about polygamy, which weren't universal in the church, but weren't unique to just one person. It was a movement of lots of polygamists that had come into the church that we know were, were already in Kirtland or the revelation or the, sorry, the section on marriage uh, wouldn't have been written the way it was written. Okay. And, and like, like, it's so interesting to me because we use these claims of someone read it. To, I, I, I think there were things circulating in well, in Nauvoo, for sure, that, you know, that people were get, like, peop, we know that people were claiming Joseph said this. So we shouldn't be that surprised that there are test testimonies saying Joseph said, like, uh, and uh, like you said, a lot of these, like the Campbellites were experimenting with this. It, it was happening. It would have been bleeding in. People Cochranites, were coming yeah. from different, the Cochranites, sorry. Yep. Yeah. It was, it was coming from different groups. So, okay. So yes, I want absolutely. you to show us your hymn book that you, you, you have, like, oh, um, I, I don't know what you were able to bring, but I know that you have some of your stuff. I just well. don't like some of these guys as well as, I mean, I love them as historic figures, but you know, W.W. Phelps bothers me a lot. William Clayton, Willard Richards, they bother me more probably than anybody else. Um, you mean you'd think they're dishonest and you should look at the, you should look at the, 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 um, the, Council of 50 minute book and look at the handwriting of Lucian Foster. He's by the way, the person they think some people think did the daguerreotype of Joseph Smith. He comes, he leaves Nauvoo just before the death of Joseph Smith to bring daguerreotype equipment back to Nauvoo, probably to photograph Joseph, but he comes back too late and Joseph is dead. But he's an incredibly his handwriting, oh my gosh, you want to see what a clerk, he was a professional clerk and bookkeeper and recorder and professionally in New York. And that's what handwriting is supposed to look like. I don't know why Willard Richards and, and William Clayton thought of themselves as clerks. And by the way, I don't know how William Clayton supported 10 wives. He's a clerk. How does he, so where did he get the money? Like who paid him? Who paid him to, I don't know. I don't know. Do you why have I'm a like guess? Okay. Families. <laughs> but okay. I like to be nice. So William Clayton, <laughs> when he's leaving, so he writes this, 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 what is the fourth diary 
is his is his Mormon trail diary. And he wouldn't have numbered these like this. He probably had diaries going back to the time he was a teenager till till he died in 1879 at age 65. So he probably had other diaries too yet. But so he's writing this this Mormon diary and he um and and he's leaving Nauvoo. He eventually they you know they get to um they get to Council Bluffs and he and he uh, or Florence and he creates this um this odometer. I have that odometer. I didn't bring it because I couldn't get it in my suitcase when I was coming out here, but I let me have a copy of it. That's you can so look cool. at my Facebook. Anybody who wants to see a colored photo of that can look at my Facebook. And you have the actual odometer. I have the original odometer. Created. Some people think the church has it, but if you look at the church, it's a replica of mine. I have the original. Oh, wow. So he's leaving Nauvoo, and he's going to take this trek, and he, he goes all the way to Utah, and then he writes a really cool book. It's so valuable. It's so scarce. He wrote a book called The Latter-day Saints Emigrant's Guide. And he used his odometer, you know, to measure the distances and and then calculate the distances back too. And he went back to St. Louis and published this, this little pamphlet. Um, it's so scarce. It's so it's it costs more than a first edition book of one. It's a really, really neat book. Do you have one? Yes, yes. But he writes this hymn, right? And the hymn is Probably as popular as any Latter-day Saint hymn, maybe in the top five, would you say? Come, come ye saints. Absolutely. Yep. All is well in Zion. It's an interesting. So I have a, <laughs> you know, the first, it's first printed in 1851 that I know of. And I just did a quick check. I'm not an expert on the hymn, but I have all the hymnals from 1835 through a hundred years or so. So um, that's the 1851. And then and they're, they're super pretty, some of them. Oh, look at those. And so anyway, that's, these are printed in England. Um, so like James String published a hymnal in 1849 and a day, another one in 1850. The Latter-day Saints in Utah didn't print a hymnal until 1871. Really? Just to, uh, to get a, 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 a understand the, the impact of James Strang. He's publishing scriptures. Bef uh, he's publishing a daily newspaper before the, or about the, I think before he his his daily newspaper came out, he published a daily newspaper before the Deseret News. Okay, wow. A lot of people that followed him, but anyway, the hymnal. This is a 1851 hymnal from England because the church did have a press in England, but they weren't doing any printing in Salt Lake City yet until 1871. They printed the Book of Mormon and hymnal in, in Salt Lake in 1871, and then famously, as you know, the 1876 Doctrine and Covenants with the Section 132 is first printed in in um, 18, 1876. Not print that in the in the English editions of the Doctrine and Covenants. Okay, wait. They didn't. They didn't. In, oh. So they re. They made English. They made Doctrine and Covenants to send to England that did not include 132. No, no, that's not what I meant. They print the Doctrine and Covenants in Nauvoo. They they print it first in in. Um, Kirtland in 1835, and it has a section forbidding polygamy. Joseph right, right. That again in 1844. 44. And the church actually prints that again from the same stereotyped plates. A stereotype plate is a semi-permanent plate. Uh, they, mm -hmm. they stereotype it, and so they print it again in 45 and 46. But they also simultaneously print the Doctrine and Covenants in England in 1845. And then they reprint that in a new, in a new type setting in 1849, and they print it in 1852 and 54, I think, and 1866. But none of those- All containing, uh, all including section 101, every reprinting. Yes, yes. and mm -hmm. they do not contain 132, especially in England, until they can finally print a Doctrine of Covenants in Utah in 1876, and then they put section 132 in it. But anyway, I digress. Yeah. This is uh, the hymnal, Come, Come Ye Saints, and I don't even want to sing it. Um, so I had a, well, I had a question about your, about the hymns, because I, I did have this one question. Um, Emma in, is it section 25? I, I knew at one time in the revelation Joseph gave to Emma, um, or the, you know, the revelation God gave to Emma through Joseph Smith. She was basically set apart to create a hymnal. 
And she worked and worked and worked on that through all of her losses. And then I was surprised to find out that Brigham Young in England was printing hymnals and in other, like, I'm curious if you know any of the, like, were they stepping on toes? That was, that was the question I'd asked oh, you. Oh, they definitely were. So she gets called to print a hymnal. I think Phelps uh, did a lot of the work um, on that hymnal. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, he was a printer and a, and a, a hymn writer too. Emma was, um, I have Emma's dad's uh, hymnal, you know, his Methodist hymnal, Isaac Hale's Methodist hymnal. So she wow. has, a, she has music in her family. Um, she does her hymnal in 1835. Uh, David Rogers, not, this is David W. Rogers, not the same thing as the art, not the same person as the artist, but a, a man named David W. Rogers in New York City uh, did a sort of plagiarized her book, did another hymnal and it looked a lot and sounded a lot like her hymn and had most of her hymns in 1838. Um, in England, though, they did legitimately need a hymnal, but I think there was some hard feelings there. So Brigham Young and John Taylor and Heber C. Kimball did a hymnal there in Manchester in 1840 and then did one almost every year afterward. Uh, Emma doesn't get a second edition out until 1841 in Nauvoo, sort of in conjunction with the the laying of the corner, the, the laying of the cornerstone of the Nauvoo, or the groundbreaking maybe of the Nauvoo Temple, whereas the the Kirtland hymnal was the was the uh, dedication of the Kirtland Temple. So I kind of think of them as like the Kirtland Temple hymnal and the Nauvoo Temple hymnal. But then, um, but then there were others that did hymnals. Johnny Page, who followed Strang, did a hymnal while Joseph was still alive, and uh, John Hardy, another one, uh, did a Boston okay. hymnal. There's was, there was a number of hymnals, but I think really, if Emma was jealous, it was a jealousy not between Brigham or, or Clayton. Clayton does this hymnal. Clayton's part of, you know, getting him getting hymns in a hymnal in, I think, 1851. I think that's the first. I'm not positive. There are people that know better than me. Okay. But I, I think his first, I think his first uh, contribution is this, this hymnal in 1851. And that's come, come ye saints. But I think it's like the diary, right? Like we we're just talking about, like, what is he up to? This either absolutely is the best fulfillment of any prophecy of Joseph Smith, because Joseph Smith prophesies in the Book of Mormon that somebody's going to sing, cry out, all is well, all is well. And he creates a hymn that says that. So he's either fulfilling Joseph Smith's property, prophecy, or he knows and he's like messing up. He's He's fulfilling he Joseph Smith's pro prophecy either knowingly or unknowingly. Like, so I've always just thought that was a really weird irony. You're thinking there's like importance to that, to teach us that this is where we are. Like, like we as members of the church maybe should be aware that we are actually fulfilling Book of Mormon prophecy in that hymn. Yeah, yeah. And and, and so, it, so you... And this doesn't all originate with, you know, he kind of models this after some existing hymns. There's a hymn called, um, I think it's called the dying Christian that he kind of models these words all as well, all as well, you know, should we die? Um, and should we die before our journeys through happy day all as well, happy day. And should we die no. well, before see, we our journey this. is through happy day all as well. And they're singing this as they're leaving Nauvoo where God told them to finish a temple. They haven't finished the temple according to Brigham Young and they're leaving the stake of Zion, where God told him was a was a place of refuge and safety. They're going out into the wilderness to claim that Zion is in the desert, and they're singing. and And by the way, a fourth of the children die along the way, and he's singing. And should we die all as well? Happy day, happy day, all as well. So you know that's in the Book of Mormon. And I have John. Second fight. I brought John Taylor's Book of Mormon from Nauvoo. And it's the one he wow. gave his wife. I was going to ask you, what Book of Mormon do you use? I assume you don't use, this is a really old one, but you don't use one of ours. Do you read oh, I have from these too. books? <laughs> oh, do you? I'm sure you do. What, you know, I what think, do you I think use? The, the Books of Mormon are, that's a big part of what I do is, is, is educating on the, which isn't for today, but educating on the, on the importance of the different editions and why they need to pres be preserved to understand the, the evolution of the text and how Oliver Cowdery and Joseph worked with the printer's manuscript and the original manuscript and the Book of Mormon first edition and created a new 
text for for 1837 in Kirtland and printed that. And then, you, you know, there were like 4,000 changes, most of them typographical though. But then they made just 40 more changes when they did this revised edition. And so that was the corrected Kirtland edition, I call it. And then the revised Nauvoo edition is only 40 changes. And then Joseph Smith printed himself an edition of the Book of Mormon in 1842. He was the printer, his name appears on the bottom. And, and there's no corrections, there's no improvements. That's, that's oh, okay. All this testimony with 1842, which is identical to the 1840. So we call it the, you know, the, that's a long story. I can go into a lot of detail. But okay. The, this is the 1840, which is a great, it's a great edition, great version. And um, boy, I also almost don't have enough light here to read this. Um, but you but you're familiar with this. This is this is uh, in in 1840 they called this section or chapter number uh, 12 and it's chapter number uh, 28 in today's. Mm -hmm. Second Nephi 28. Yep. Uh, and you're going to let me preach. Wow, this is great. I don't get to preach very often. <laughs> I have some. Other I'm just looking that... it up as well. Yeah, we, we, so, we should wrap it up relatively soon, but this is fascinating. I want to okay, hear. So I want to read yep. a few. I want to read four scriptures. I want to read this one. And it says, and it says, uh, others he will pacify and lull them away into carnal security that they will say, all is well in Zion. Yea, Zion prospereth, all is well. And thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them. Now this is while they're being led to Utah. <laughs> and then leadeth them carefully away down to hell. And then wow. further down, therefore, woe be unto him that is at ease in Zion. Woe be unto him that crieth, all is well. And woe be unto him that hearkeneth unto the precepts of men. And so then I like to connect that. I want to connect for you that word precepts of men. It continues uh, a little further, on, on, in my case, on page 113. Cursed is he that putteth his trust in man or maketh flesh his arm. That's like trusting in human you know, as opposed to the rod of iron, right? So you're trusting. Cursed is he that putteth his trust. Just so you know, I have these verses all memorized. These have been some of my it. favorites for a long time for the exact reason you're saying. Continue. Or shall hearken yes. unto the precepts of men, save their precepts shall be given by the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, there's a parallel to that in Jeremiah. Do you know about that one? Tell me. So in Jeremiah, it says, it uses the same words. It says, Thus saith the Lord, cursed be, I get to preach, I love it. I usually preach on Mormon Road. In <laughs> Thus saith the Lord, cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. Wow. Well, a lot of people argue the church has been saying for a hundred and some years, you know, the church is just going to grow. It's supposed to grow. It's going to grow indefinitely. But that's not what Doctrine and Covenants 45 says. Doctrine and Covenants 45 says, and when the times of the Gentiles come in. So those that are, if anybody wants to write this down, it's 45 verses 28 through 30, section 45 verses 20 through 30 says, and when the times of the Gentiles has come in, a light shall break forth among that, them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of my gospel. But they receive it not, for they perceive not the light, and they turn their hearts from me because of the precepts of men. So there you have it again. I'm tying this in, the precepts of men. And then it says, and in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. What? The times the Gentiles, you almost think they're never going to be fulfilled. The the it's going to roll like a stone cut Keep out of going a mountain, on forever. on going until everybody's just like us. But that's not yep. what Joseph Smith's revelations say. And so then that kind of if you don't understand that kind of the generations of the the times the Gentiles be fulfilled, it comes from one Nephi thirteen, and it was this uh, almost like a chiasmus where it says, uh, you know, the gospel will go first to the Jews. And they'll reject it. That's at the time of Jesus. The gospel goes first to the Jews and they'll reject it. And then it goes to the Gentiles and they accept it. But in the lat, that's the former days. And then in the latter days, the 
gospel goes first to the Gentiles and they reject it. And then it goes to the Jews and they accept it. And that is a theme that runs all the way through Latter-day Saint preaching in the 1830s and 1840s. They are not arguing in the 1830s and 1840s that everybody is going to accept Joseph Smith. The argument is that he's going to be martyred and, and rejected and the church is going to collapse. And then the gospel is going to go to the Jews. So. Wow. Well, and I want to. 1 Nephi 13. Okay, so I just want to add, I'm going to go, I haven't connected 1 Nephi 13 to it, but um, where you stopped reading in 2 Nephi 28, I think is important because it continues. And um, I think it's important that it says, yea, woe be unto him that saith, we have received and we need no more. And I think that that's what we tend to do is we already know everything we need to know. And it goes on to continue. And that's where we talk about those who tremble lest they shall fall because they're on a sandy foundation. I've quoted that so many times in this podcast, that all of our false traditions about the prophet can never lead us astray. And And the truthfulness of 132, that are our false traditions. And Woe be unto him that shall say, we have received the word of God and we need no more of the word of God for we have enough. That's that's our danger in our day. That's directly to us. I, I actually love your preaching because I completely agree with it. Okay, and well, I'll go we back need- just a little bit more to the top of 28 then. They rob the, to- the poor because of their fine sanctuaries. They rob the poor because of their fine clothing. And they persecute the meek and the poor in heart because in their pride... They are puffed up. They wear stiff necks and high heads. Yea, because of pride and wickedness and abominations and whoredoms, they have all gone astray, save it be a few who are the humble followers of Christ. Nevertheless, they are led that in many instances they do err because they are taught by the precepts of men. By the precepts of men. Yep, yep. Okay, so I did an episode on Zion versus polygamy that if you're interested in, I use that exact scripture in it to talk about how they are antithetical to one another. So, John, this has been fascinating. I have loved talking to you and all of the information you've brought. Is there anything you wanted to add or include that we didn't cover? No, this was fun. Thank you. We can do this again on another. Yes. I would... I would love to talk to you again. I'm going to have to digest a lot of this and I have a lot of, you know, so many things to look into, but you are a wealth of knowledge. I would love to see more of your artifacts and have you explain more. And um, anyway, I can't thank you enough. I do like, like if there is anything that you didn't get to say that you wanted to, I don't want you to feel like. Just follow me on my social media and come and see me in Independence. Everybody's pretty much welcome. So. Okay. And maybe we can go to, what, where was it? Uh, where's Mormon Road? Is that, did you say in Illinois? Oh, Burlington, or? Wisconsin. Yes. Burlington, Wisconsin. Well, I'll go yes. to, well, I'll go to Wisconsin on Mormon Road and hear you preach to us. So. You're full. You're so nice. Thank you for this opportunity to share together. And I just like everything you're doing so much and you're so good at it. You're really, really good at this. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. I hope to talk to you again. This has okay. been amazing. So thank you. You're welcome. All right. I want to again thank John for coming on and thank all of you for joining us. Please, if you have any further questions that you would like um, to be able to ask John, include them in the comments because I think there's a lot more information that we could dig into. I really loved the scriptural theological discussion at the end of um, our discussion that we had. I hope that you found that insightful. I would invite anyone to, I've, I've mentioned several times, 2 Nephi 28 and 29 and how critically important I think they are for us. So it was wonderful to me to hear his perspective and how it aligned with mine. I thought it was great. So anyway, thank you again for joining us and I hope you will stick with us as we continue this new deep dive into Joseph's polygamy. We'll see you next time.